John Croft is from up upstate, if you want to call it that, Ohio, Sandusky. And they, for the longest time, had one of the fastest roller coasters in the world. Um, and I don't know if that's still true, but again, it's, it's a fun little amusement park. So that's where John grew up. He went to Denison for his undergraduate degree, which is uh, just in Granville, which is um, just east of Columbus, Ohio. And then he went to University of Pittsburgh for his JD and for a degree in uh, international affairs. John has written uh, another book as well about his um, couple of years in Central Asia. And then he turned to the, his project to write about uh, growing up as part of a crayon family. And so we're delighted to have him uh, and, and share his uh, author experience with us. So John. Thank you very much, Todd. And I'm very delighted to be here. I'm hoping to have a little bit of fun and share not only some history of crayons in my, my growing up, but also maybe hear some recollections of, of your own about growing up with crayons. What I thought I would do for starters is I was going to read just the first two pages of the book to kind of give you a scene setter, to give you a feel. It is both a, a history of a crayon company that was started in my family four generations ago. And it is also part memoir of, of my recollections as a little kid growing up with this crayon company in my family history. And so it's a blend of those two things. But after I do the reading, then I'm gonna do a short presentation with a slide deck that'll show you a little bit more visual about the history, the crayon company and the crayon products. But I do want to pause for a moment and um, admire this picture. Our very own Sterling Hoffman took that picture as my, my author bio photo. So uh, I thought it came out really well. So just, just a little congratulations to, to Sterling. We, we kept it in the Rotary family. So, so I'm going to dive in with the very first two pages of chapter one. And it's called Pink Piano. Almost everyone is a snob about something, wine, food, music, or any of the finer things in life. Me, at the age of five, I was a snob about crayons. And I judged the crayons of those few classmates who did not buy the hometown brand, American crayons, and thought to myself, those Crayola crayons aren't any good. American crayons were the crayons that we had at home, at school, and they were the crayons that were made in the factory down the street, a factory built by my great grandfather and my great uncles. From my earliest memories, crayons were plentiful in our house. And my older sister, Anne and I had the basic eight pack boxes, plus the wide 16 packs, the 24 packs, both at home and our desks at school. The largest boxes with 80 crayons came with a built-in sharpener and slanted lid that flipped back to display crayons tightly packed like spectators on ascending rows of bleachers. After a few sessions of coloring the crayons, neat points were worn down to stubby ends and some of the paper wrappers were peeled away, leaving naked waxy cylinders of color. The well-ordered arrangement became a chaotic and incomplete spectrum. Anne and I had such an excess of crayons that my father would collect them in plastic buckets and store them in our unfinished basement, along with a large spool of newsprint hung under the stairs. We would unspool a few feet of newsprint at a time and tear off a sheet with ragged edges and draw like mad artists on the concrete floor. Anne selected a lot of blue and turquoise drawing dolphins and flying blue whales and other sea creatures with long curly Q whiskers. She used black to outline the hulls and smokestacks of great ocean liners of the early 20th century. She added wings to the Titanic, the Olympic and the Normandy and showed them flying through the clouds with flying whales. For me, I drew long circuitous race car courses and I needed a lot of brown and a lot of green to fill in the trees and the the courses 
And when I finished drawing, I would stage races between my matchbox cars along the length of the newsprint. And we never cleaned up, leaving those loose crayons strewn about in giant wads of crumpled newsprint littering the floor. And sometimes my sister Anne would tape her works to the bare cylinder block walls of the basement, much like the prehistoric murals in the caves of Lascaux, France. One of my earliest memories was in the smell and the taste of crayons. After long sessions of coloring, I stuck my face into the bucket of crayons and inhaled the waxy smell to get a crayon high. I drew blue racing stripes on my arms and gashing red wounds on my face. I plunged my hands into the buckets, past my wrists and agitated the crayons, pulling up fistfuls and letting them spill through my fingers like a mad miser with gold coins. The flakes wedged under my fingernails and marked my hands and wrists with random colors, making it look like I had some strange skin disease. I unwrapped my favorite colors, blue and green, and I bit into each, but both had the same waxy taste. The crayons in the buckets bore my teeth marks. One night after dinner, when Ann and I were eight and six, my mother said that we could draw with our crayons on the dining room walls. The room was large enough to hold a dining room table that seated 12, and I can't remember what I drew, but I knew I drew with gusto. Anne drew her wild imaginative animals and more ocean liners, and my parents joined in, recreating familiar doodles from their childhood. Our dining room was illustrated by the entire family the walls embedded with the American crayon colors. The very next week, the drawings were wallpapered over, forever sealed into the walls of the house. So I'll stop there, but that's the first two pages of the book, and it's meant to give you um, from the very earliest uh, how much crayons were part of my life. So uh, thank you. So. So what I thought I would do now is just give you a little bit of an overview of the company itself. I, so that's super quick. That's just me, a snapshot of me in high school um, on the local academic program in Cleveland. Uh, I'm, I'm somewhere in there on the football team. So growing up in, in Huron High, here in Ohio, which is right next door to Sandusky, um, you know, good sort of good Midwestern town up on the lake. Um, now, this is a, a map of Sandusky, and this is, this is also our scene setter. The period that, we're, that I'm talking about with the crayons is set around 1890. And in Sandusky, as well as a lot of the Midwest, what I discovered in researching this book about the crayon company is there was this tremendous spirit of innovation going on. Uh, this was before, the, this was after the Civil War, but up, leading up to World War One, where you had, um, this is particularly strong in the Midwest, you had a number of uh, families and solo innovators who felt they could go out and create whatever their mind, they put their minds to. Uh, at this, you know, shortly during this period, for example, the Wright brothers were right downstate working in their bicycle garage in, in basically inventing uh, powered flight. Uh, right around the corner, you had Henry Ford uh, developing the assembly line for Ford motor cars. There were literally hundreds of startup companies going on at this time uh, to create, you name it, uh, automobiles, airplanes. There were electric trolley lines that were, were being built. So. Um, Sandusky has this wonderful location. It sits right on Lake Erie, right there. So we're going to talk about this particular company, the American Crayon Company. I know many of you, most everybody is familiar with Crayola crayons as the leading brand. And that is the, that is the leading brand that survives today. But um, at the time, crayons were coming along. This was, this was brand new for the, 
for the country. Um, there were there were basically three families that came together in Sandusky to create the first children's wax crayons, and it took this this set of three families uh, to come together to to make this idea a reality. So the first fellow that we've got here is a very sort of imposing looking gentleman with the beard. His name was Marcellus Cowdery. Uh, he was a great, great grandfather. Marcellus Cowdery was the first superintendent of uh, the Sandusky schools there. And he, he was a very forward looking man in terms of he wanted the latest in school technology teaching techniques. He was a, uh, he emphasized handwriting and penmanship, something that we don't think about today. But um, he had to every morning go into his schools and hear the screech of this very, very crude and unrefined hunks of, of chalk on the chalkboard. Basically, the chalk that was used in schools at this time were unrefined uh, hand-hewn blocks of chalk from the cliffs of Dover in England. It was, it was carved out of the cliffs of Dover, stored in sailing ships that were used as ballast. And when they docked in the United States, they wanted to find a way to repurpose this chalk. And so they would just break it up into to fist, fist sized pieces and they would turn it over to school teachers and let them try to do what they could with it. But it was incredibly impractical, made horrible noise to Marcellus's ears. It crumbled. It was not workable. So Marcellus decides, this, this can't stand. I'm going to turn to my brother-in-law, was a man by the name of William Curtis. And I, I love this picture. Uh, William Curtis was a sergeant in the Union Army, one of the Ohio regiments. And I, I love the picture. He's in full Union uniform there with a you know, a, a rifle and a sword, and he's looking pretty serious. Uh, the unit he was in had seen a lot of uh, a lot of action. I don't know what he saw, but uh, William was also a very inventive guy. He had grown up on a farm and knew a lot about the soil and could really uh, pretty much make make anything repaired or or invent new things if he had to have called upon so marcellus turns to william cowdery and says you're an inventive fellow what can we do about this chalk that sounds so so awful well he he knew of a quarry nearby in the sandusky bay area and there were all these deposits of gypsum gypsum was a was a leftover byproduct of the glacier era that the glaciers came and retreated several times forming the Great Lakes, but they left these deposits of gypsum, very, very fine, almost like a silky powder. So he, he accessed his gypsum from the quarry nearby and he began to mix it up on the family stove. Again, thinking of that, that power of innovation that, that you, can, you can solve almost any problem. So he would boil up these concoctions with regular chalk, the gypsum, and some other secret sauce that he put into it. And then he would pour it out into molds and they would dry it, bake it in the family oven and, and let it dry. So this is, this is the beginning of, it's gonna lead up to crayons. You can see where this may be going. So we're gonna go to the next um, couple of people that are involved. There was a gentleman by the name of John Cowdery who had some business sense. He was, uh, brother of Marcellus Cowdery, and he said, I know I can, I can put a, a business together and make this work. So he got involved um, and formed their very, very first company called Western School Supply. But the key for this crayon company to, to take off was this man here, a man by the name of John Whitworth. Uh, he's another great grandfather who I'm, I'm named after. And John Whitworth had an eighth grade education, but he, he knew he had become very uh, uh, successful in town and, and was now on the, the chair of the, the local bank, uh, the chairman of the local bank. 
he raised capital. He's what, what you would call today as a venture capitalist. So he raised the money and said, you have a fantastic idea here, very revolutionary. And they issued their first public stock in 1890. And they formed what was called the American Crayon Company, which was, at the time, it was primarily just chalk. Uh, chalk that was used not so much, it was used somewhat in schools, but it was also used by railroad workers to mark crossings. It was used by tailors to mark garments. Uh, it, there, was a lot, there were a lot of working, uh, and, and carpenters as well, so there were a lot of working uses for chalk. But they began to add pigment to it, and they began to add color to it because they thought, there's some possibilities here. You're, you're, now, you're now at a time when uh, the kindergarten curriculum had become very, very popular. It was being brought into American schools from uh, the German influence, a lot of the German immigrants that had come over. And part of the kindergarten curriculum emphasized the need for children to be creative the need for children to, to come up with, um, uh, you know, be able to express themselves through color. And so they were seeing there's a business opportunity here. Um, so you've got on Whitworth, you've got stock issued. Um, these, are, these are some pictures, maybe a little hard to see, that I actually found in uh, the, the family archive. Somebody along the way had tried to do a recreation. It's, it's hard to see, but a diorama of William Curtis cooking chalk in the family stove. It's, that's what that one on the left is supposed to be. And the one on the right is the very first uh, American crayon factory in Sandusky. And when you work with crayons, you also work with a lot of oils that were highly flammable. Well, that factory burned to the ground in 1901. The very next year, they built a brand new modern factory by 1902 standards. And this is a picture of a, a sort of a, a sketch of it here uh, that was built. The company never missed an order. He, and in fact, many of the customers never knew that the, the first factory burned to the ground. But it was, it was um, uh, the, in the center of Sandusky and they began then to um, really become a nationwide distributor of of chalk. Oh, this is actually a very old, old sign that I, I recovered from the factory. It's, it's hard to see, but I kept it because it's got my grandfather's name on it. It was, a, it was a notice that visitors could not come into the factory without his permission. Now, this is one of the very first crayon products that came out, crayons as we know them today. I, I want to pause and just say, the early term crayon, there was a lot of confusion around what did you mean when you said crayon? It, it was used to describe both chalk that had color to it. It was also used to describe wax that had color to it. And so they would sometimes package things to say wax crayons or chalk crayons. Well, this is, this is one of the very, very first products that they came out that were wax crayons. And this is key because um, they could make them at a very affordable price. They actually had um, smaller versions of these crayons that they sold. They were called penny packs. They sold for one penny. And uh, at the same time, Binny and Smith, makers of Crayola, came out with their own, their own brand. They were literally coming out within months of each other with color wax crayons for children. And if you if you can think back to another time where there's a major innovation going on, um, it was very much a highly competitive time uh, for crayons because they were just being introduced to the schools. I think back to when, when I was in college and they were introducing different computers and you had Apple vying to get their product in and you had IBM or uh, Hewlett Packard vying to get their product in and they were practically giving computers away to students because they wanted that brand loyalty. Well, the exact same thing was happening at this time uh, for crayons where you would have, for example, Binny and Smith would offer a color crayon competition where you would, you would have a competition to, to draw pictures and win money. Well, 
American Crayon would try to counter that with something of, of their own. Like they, they came up with a specific set of uh, a magazine for school teachers to learn how to use crayons and, and give lessons and instruct their students on how to use crayons. So highly competitive time. This is right, right in the early 1900s. Um, a couple of period pieces here. This is an interior shot of the crayon company. And um, this, this is, um, uh, I happen to pick it, this is about 1916. And this is Charles Evans Hughes, who was a candidate for president. He was a Republican nominee that year running against um, Wilson. And Sandusky was such a important industrial hub at that point that he stopped at the factory gave a speech and toured the factory. And you can see all of these, these wooden crates that are surrounding them just filled, uh, filled with either chalk or crayons. And they use these wooden, wooden boxes as their primary means of shipping. And here's an outside view of, of where he's giving his speech. There's the podium is over there to the right with the flags. And I, I love these old factory buildings because they, they had him bedded in brick you know, the name of the company there, American Crayon, uh, and, the, and the town. What I want to show now are just a few of the early products that they came out with. They, these, were, these were packages that were designed to help children learn and use, use crayons because we take them for granted. But uh, this, is, this was all brand new, and children didn't really know exactly sometimes what, how to create with them. So they would come out with these beautifully illustrated packages with stencils and, and the very first coloring books were inside of them. That's an example of uh, some of the little coloring pictures that they would have in these books for, for children to, to use. They're, they're all inside of that, that box lid that I showed you, which some of those, those packages were illustrated by well-known children's illustrators of the day. They spent a lot of time and resources toward marketing these, these products to, to have these packages. This, um, this is a picture of one of their catalogs that they, they would send around to teachers and institutions. And on that catalog, it's what is important is um, their trademark that they were known for. Every company has a, has a trademark. They picked the uh, Yellowstone Geyser Old Faithful. So they always trademark their products under this old faithful um, representation. So I just wanted to, to mention that. Um, there it is again in more of an art deco format. And this is a picture of a magazine. It was called Everyday Art. And this, this is the magazine that they started to help teachers learn how to give lessons to their students. And the Everyday Art magazine ran for about well, it ran from the early 20s to the 70s. So that's an example there. Uh, just some more examples of early crayons. These are from the 1930s. This was a, a brand that they had called Blendwell. Um, and you see how it, it specifies wax crayons where um, they're still working out the terminology. There's wax crayons, there's chalk crayons. I like this picture too. This was, this was an example of one of their delivery trucks that they had designed to look like carrying a giant piece of chalk on its back. I mean, I, you can maybe think to the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile or hot dogs. Well, this, this, this is the forerunner perhaps in the idea of showing your product. Uh, you've got a giant piece of chalk and they would advertise that they were the oldest crayon company in the world. Um, which, which in fact, they could make that claim, and they were the largest producer at one time. They produced more color crayons than anywhere else in the world in this you know, medium to small size town in, in Ohio. And in fact, that's where the title of the book comes from, Color Capital of the World. For the longest time, their marketing people used, used that as part of their marketing strategy to say, we, American Crayon Company, are the color capital of the world. They, they were making more crayons at this time than, than Vinnie and Smith, uh, who was a close second with their Crayola brand. Um, this, is a, this is the lid of a metal box that contained some of their chalk, dustless chalk, which they, they had really perfected. It's a, it's a very 
sort of silky chalk that was uh, very smooth on the board, but it's also, uh, you can see that it, it pays tribute to the origin of the first chalk coming from the cliffs of Dover in England. And I, I also like the box because uh, it's got a nice little picture of the illustration of the factory there. Um, that was from the 30s. Uh, these are some of their other products. Uh, maybe maybe hard to see, but one of the things that, that they were also best known for, and I think more people may be familiar with this, is they made these steel cased watercolor kits. I've got one here, uh, maybe maybe hard to see, but um, a lot of a lot of kids in grade school would have these. And you would you open them up, and there are your your colors on the inside, and you would mix them in water in the in the lid here in the different containers, and they were they were probably uh, after crayons they were maybe the second most popular item that that American crayon made for elementary school students, and they were made under a brand called Prang. Prang is still in that brand name is still in existence today. It is. It's gone through a number of the, the the company has been bought out, and but that that intellectual property and that brand name still live on uh, today. Even though, spoiler alert, American Crayon Company does not exist anymore. <laughs> I'm giving a little bit away. So, just a, a couple more pictures. The ones on the right, it says Amer the American Crayon. Those were probably the last the last version of what the factory made as children's crayons before um, they're eventually bought out. And there's uh, uh, the factory meets a, a very sad, sad end. Uh, those on the left, I call them working crayons. The ones around, across the top, they're sort of like blue spheres in that box. Those were, those were pieces of carpenter's chalk that the carpenters would use to mark their work. The ones, the yellow and the blue, are used often by railroad workers to mark sightings and, and mark cars. Uh, they like them because the crayon would stay on, rain or shine. Um, the ones, the first on the, the bottom shelf there are tailor's chalk. So those were what tailors would use when you go in and get your suit or dress fit, fitted. And the ones in the middle there, hard to see also, in the red, those were called uh, Brando. And that, that was an attempt to actually use an alternative to branding livestock. They were meant to be permanent markers that would mark, um, mark livestock. So uh, some interesting variations there that, that I wasn't aware of when I did all this research. Um, maybe not so exciting, but that is a copy of a stock certificate that was issued for the company. Uh, and one of the reasons, again, I'm partial to this is um, it's my grandfather's signature down in the lower left, John Whitworth. I never knew the man. Again, I'm named after, I'm named after him, but didn't know him. Uh, a, an aerial view of the factory uh, from '56. It was, it was located right on the rail line in Sandusky, so they they had easy access to, to railroad uh, shipments. Again, this is this is a copy of the picture of the '64 pack, which was sort of the gold standard for crayons between Crayola and American Crayon. They, they, they really considered this to be their flagship product, uh, the 64 pack of crayons that you opened with the sharpener. And this is their, their version. And th this is kind of a sad point here. We're, we're gonna wrap up, uh, but this is one of the final pictures of the factory before it was demolished. And I, I will jump ahead in our history and just share with you, um, the company was sold and it went through a number of different owners. It, it, it was eventually sold in the late 50s and continued to operate at full capacity up into the 80s. But, but in 1990, when you had the North American Free Trade Agreement come into place, this, this company was one of those that, that fell victim to the to the NAFTA arrangement and the the owners of the factory were it was a company called Dixon Ticonderoga you may know that name because they make the number two yellow pencil if you've, if you've ever used the number two yellow that's the company that made them they were many of them made at this factory they 
they took a look at NAFTA and they said, you know, we can make these crayons cheaper if we move everything down to Mexico. So there was a plan to take out all the machinery, ship it down to Mexico and, and use Mexican labor. Well, they brought up uh, the, the laborers to be trained on the new machinery and the, the local workers in the Sandusky plant refused. Um, they, they eventually worked it out. They brought in substitutes to train them and the machinery was removed, shipped down to Mexico and the factory just sat uh, empty for over a decade and it was eventually uh, demolished. So there is, there's nothing on the site today. It, it, it no longer exists. One of the things that I'm actually trying to do uh, with, with the book that I've come out with is I'm also requesting that the state of Ohio um, put a historical marker on that site to mark it as, as an important part of the, this, the state's industrial heritage. So um, that's, a, that's sort of a quick, a quick ending there. Apologize for, for, for just skipping across all that history, but I hope this has been um, uh, somewhat entertaining, somewhat interesting. Maybe you learned a little something about crayons, but I really do appreciate the honor of, of being able to, to speak uh, to you all today about uh, something that's been very important to me. So, uh, uh, so the, I was interested in what was what happened to it. So, so you explained to me and are they still making the crayons in Mexico? So on the, on the crayon factory in Mexico, it, it, the, the venture actually collapsed in less than a year. I think a lot of the machinery was very, very delicate and it, it, some of it hadn't actually been updated in all the time it had been in the factory and the workers in Sandusky knew all the little quirks of the machines and what to do if something went wrong. And it, I think I, it just didn't, it just didn't, the machine was so old that I think it didn't survive the, the move. And I don't think that the new workers really knew the machines like the, the old ones did. Now, there are, there are brands that, that were owned by the parent company, Dixon Ticonderoga, which still exists, like the, the brand Prang, it still lives on. You can still find Prang products, but not anywhere near the quantities that, that it used to be made in. I'm gonna ask a question about Crayola and American Crayon. Those two never merged? Those two never merged, and they, have, they both have really interesting parallel histories. Crayola, uh, interestingly enough, it was also very much a family venture at the time. It's a combination of two families, Binney and Smith, and, and part of the impetus there was um, the, the wife of Smith was a school teacher. And she was also urging her husband, who she knew was an inventor, to come up with some kind of inexpensive color crayon or, or, or tools that her students could use. And they, they do give credit to American Crayon probably six months before coming out with the very first wax crayons. But no, they've, they never merged. Um, Crayola, I think, in the end, did a better job managing and modernizing, whereas money, I don't think they ever modernized enough with, with American Crayon to keep it competitive into the 80s. Thank you for sharing your story. It's really compelling. Looking at uh, the closure, eventually going you know, through NAFTA down to Mexico and all that, uh, now all of a sudden we're onshoring, bringing things back from overseas whether it's from China, Vietnam, or wherever. So what can we learn from the lessons that you've now studied of this 100 year plus history of this company and your family that we should have been aware of 50 years ago, we started offshoring. And now that we have to onshore, how does all this tie together as a history, maybe through the example of your own family company? And thank you for sharing this, a powerful story. Thank you for the question. I'm, I'm a little, I, I do have to admit, I'm, I'm not an expert in terms of economic policy and, and how, how we might press ahead and, and sort of retool. I, what I will say is, you know, it, I think 
these these products you paid a, a premium for. Sure, you could you can have them made more cheaply, but but sort of look what happened is the the attention to quality and the the also the community impact. I think we should be aware of this company really. Um, it was the heart and soul of, of Sandusky as the oldest and longest, and, and I think at one time the largest employer. And when it left, it the, the the city is still sort of recovering. There were a lot of closures at the time. This wasn't the only one. There was a there were paper companies, there were auto companies, there were tool and die companies, and all of them were closing their doors at this time. I will say that. I, I've been I talked and interviewed one of the city managers at the time who is saying we're not we don't want to go back to the past we understand that that might be unrealistic but we want to honor and respect that past and use it in a way that we we can transform it to something else so what Sandusky is doing right now they're capitalizing on their their waterfront and they're turning them turning to they're pivoting to uh, making themselves a, a tourist destination, as, as we mentioned at the outset, they have this great amusement park, they have this waterfront, you know, they build themselves now as the roller coaster capital of the world. Actually, in French, a crayon is a pencil, so I'm wondering how that morphed into a crayon. But the other thing I wanted to say, when I was a child, my favorite crayon was red. And now that I've matured a little, it's blue. <laughs> but they had, <clears throat> but they had one called burnt sienna which was frankly an abomination <laughs> and i'm wondering whether your company ever made burnt sienna so a lot of a lot of great questions in there i'll take that one first so there was actually a difference in the naming conventions between the companies for example crayola would would be more poetic and flowery in its naming they would say something was burnt sienna whereas american crayon was a very plain language orange purple you know, blue. There was not a lot of the, the flowery language, and that's that was one way they distinguished themselves. Um, and I also happen to know that blue tastes the same as green if, if you're <laughs> if you're tasting crayons. But. I have read your book, and it's wonderful both for the history and I, having used crayons, never really thought much about where they came from. But my question is. Uh, was the formula the same for the two companies? Did they copy your formula? So, so I don't know exactly because it was a well-guarded piece of intellectual property. Um, what what that first mixture was on the family stovetop, I can't say precisely. I think in the end, I mean, uh, I'd have to taste them to find out. No, but I, I that 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 is a that is a good question. Um, I, I, you know, I think today, oh, actually, what, what I was going to mention is what I learned is when I was researching this book, these companies were, were in strict competition. And I found in the Smithsonian files, Crayola had donated to Smithsonian. They had opposition research on American. So I was able to go in and see what Crayola was looking at American, what they thought was the threat. Now, I didn't find the, the formulas in there, but they they were watching each other what they were doing with products and how they were um, competing in that space. Thank you, John. As you know, we have a tradition with the club of presenting a Trees for the Capital certificate, which which does or describes our commitment as a club to plant a tree here in Washington D.C. in memory of this speaking arrangement. I'm told they will provide uh, geo cords for you at some point. Um, you should be able to find it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. For